This morning, the latest on President Trump and the coronavirus following Friday's stunning announcements. The president, the first lady, a senior advisor, and others have COVID-19. We're speaking with a leading doctor in our area this morning. We'll also tackle the impact that this could have on the campaigns as we move into the final four weeks of election 2020, all on This Week in Jacksonville. And the situation involving the president and his health seems to evolve frequently and at a moment's notice. Well, we're grateful to have Dr. Sunil Joshi with us in studio today. Dr. Joshi with us just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about flu vax jacks. Now we're back to talking about COVID-19 for a pretty important reason. How surprising is this that the president, uh, these months in since March, when we really fully said the pandemic is here, COVID-19 is here, how surprising it is it that he would end up uh, contracting the illness? You know, honestly, it is very surprising. You know, you would think because the president of the United States has access to all of all of the best health care experts in the country, in particular population health experts, and through this pandemic has been advised on a daily basis about what's the right thing to do or how to prevent um, contracting the virus. So it is very, very surprising to hear it. But then in reality, when you see what has been happening over the last few months, in particular, some of his campaigns where he is in-person campaigning and people are really not socially distancing and really are not wearing masks around him, um, then it becomes very unsurprising and almost expected to some extent um, when you're around so many people for so long um, that it, then it almost becomes surprising that he wasn't infected sooner uh, than he has been. So we're going to hear from him uh, in, in a few moments. I want you to hear he made a statement yesterday that, that's important to hear at least a portion of. Uh, a couple of different views of the president because Friday, just before he got on Marine One and, and was airlifted essentially to Walter Reed Hospital, he made a statement. Yeah. Uh, then he made a statement yesterday from the hospital. He looked different. What, would, what did you view there in seeing yeah. the two different looks of the president on those Yeah, days? good question because on Friday, um, when you saw the statement that he made from the White House before he left to go to the hospital, he didn't look like his normal self. You know, we had just seen him on Tuesday night with a lot of vigor and kind of his normal self as the president of the United States. And then on Friday, when he was speaking directly into the camera, he looked a little weaker than normal. Um, and, and he certainly didn't, his, his voice sounded a little gargly as well. And so it's like, okay, it does look like somebody who is ill at this moment. And then yesterday, <clears throat> late last night, um, they released a video of him in his presidential suite in the hospital, and he certainly sounded a lot more like the president. So, so maybe a couple days of rest and relaxation has made a major impact for him. So I wanted to talk about this. We're, you know, so the president, we also heard the first lady. Other people in his sphere have, have the illness. When it comes to the president and the first lady, initially we're hearing they have different kinds of symptoms. So I wanted to get at that. That's part of what we've been learning about this virus is yeah. it, it impacts people differently. It really does. And that's what makes it hard to pinpoint this virus. You know, the one common symptom is the fever. But then after that, it could be anything from coughing to fatigue to lightheadedness to even some GI symptoms. Now, remember, the president is significantly older than, than his wife as well. So that puts him at risk as well. And so his symptoms can certainly be much, much more more significant than someone who is younger and healthier. I want to look at uh, some of those risk facts. We'll show you some of the details that make the president a higher risk for complications. So, uh, Dr. Josie, jump in any time yep. here. But so we know that by virtue of his age, 74, and his weight, he's in a higher risk group. Uh, officially, clinically, I guess, the president is obese. Uh, obesity is a risk factor for a more severe form of the illness. And then according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, people in that age range, 65, 74, face five times greater risk uh, of hospitalization, 90 times greater risk of death from COVID-19. And that's compared to the young adults age, right? That 18 right. to 29. Right, and that's, that's in that 18 to 29 year old group is the comparison group. But keep in mind, he's 74, okay? A year from now, he'll be 75. So he's right at the edge of that risk factor group where he's 90 times more likely to to pass away from this virus. At 75, you're 220 times more likely to pass away from this virus. So <clears throat> he's right at that risk. And so when we hear that he's going to the hospital with this illness, it certainly worries folks that um, he is, he's in a, in a very difficult situation for his overall health. And then you add that risk factor of him being obese and that obese category, which increases his risk three times as well. And we don't really know some of the other health issues that he may be dealing with at that age and at that level of uh, body mass index, he may indeed have hypertension or some of the other risk factors as well. We don't know that. It's interesting because the, the president's doctor uh, made some statements yesterday yeah. that uh, initially uh, were concerning. And 
felt a little bit like we're not getting the whole picture. That, it's a tough spot for that doctor to be in, right? It is a tough spot because, you know, he's balancing HIPAA regulations. He's balancing what the um, administration might be telling him to give out in terms of the overall information and what the public needs to know. And, and I think the biggest concern was the, the possibility that the president may indeed have known that he was positive um, 72 hours prior to Saturday, which means that he would have known he was positive on Wednesday. Um, and the, the physician did change that and say that he meant 36 hours, not 72 hours. Um, and the reason that 72 hours number is so important is because there was a campaign stop in the middle there. Um, and he was exposed to Chris Christie, who now is positive and in the hospital himself. Well, I'll point out that he was recently in Jacksonville. We covered the event that he did out at Cecil Field. And I was there. My observation was the people associated with the president's campaign, certainly the security people there, uh, everybody associated with the airport or, or police or whatever, had masks. Right. Um, but you said this is a, really something where we should be thinking about. This, this points to uh, the impact it can have in a broad range, not just on the president, but to everybody out there, whether we are taking some of those um, considerations that the CDC says are important. Oh, absolutely. And, and so, you know, up until now, I think there was without question a large group of people who felt like, well, it's my personal choice. I'm not going to wear the mask. I'll be fine. And now they're seeing the president of the United States be infected and 27 people in that close circle now have tested positive for COVID-19. And none of them were wearing masks at the, at the uh, Supreme Court nomination uh, uh, presentation or at some of his rallies as well, or even at the debate. And so you can see how quickly this virus can spread. The importance of wearing a mask and being socially distant cannot be overstated in preventing you, you yourself picking up the virus or spreading the virus if you have it as well. And so, so I think people hopefully are learning that. And I think the president has probably learned that as well, um, that taking the advice of the CDC and some of the health experts is really the wise thing to do. Uh, bef before we run out of time here, I want to talk about some of the treatments that we know are being given to President Trump. Yes. Friday night, he started a five-day course of remdesivir. This is an antiviral drug that slows the virus's ability to multiply, and he's taken at least two doses of the drug already. Friday, also given a dose of an experimental drug, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. It's a, a test drug, and it provides antibodies to help the immune system fight the virus. The president's White House physician we were talking about also said he was taking uh, these, you know, zinc, vitamin D. Uh, right. I'm not sure, famotidine? Famotidine is, famotidine is basically an acid suppressor, but there was some thought that it might be helpful for COVID. I think of, of those, the most, the most interesting thing is, is the Regeneron product, which is a polyclonal uh, antibody. So these are antibodies that are produced in the lab that actually bind to the virus and prevent the virus from entering into human cells. And it really is just going through studies right now. They've only had 270 people that they've studied, and, and it does look like it may be effective. Um, but it's a very, very small group of people who have been studied in the big picture. And so right now, in order to be able to give that medication to somebody who is not in the study, it has to be done for compassionate use. And of course, he's the president of the United States, so you think he would, he would get that. Uh, he'd be more likely to be able to get the, the drug. Um, and so maybe that's what's helped him turn the corner very quickly and stop the viral load and the viral replication. Um, who knows? But he seems to be getting better, according to the reports that we're hearing. And I would think it would be more likely to be that product than any of the other products that he's taking right now. Yeah, no, um, no medication medication comes without risk. Right. So doctors making that choice there on Regeneron or these other things have to say, well, we think the benefits are going to be more important than the risk. Absolutely. Right? And then, of course, it's up to the president at that point whether he wants to take the risk or not. Because again, th this drug, this new drug, has not been studied long enough to understand what the risk factors would be, not just in the short term, in the long term of taking it. And that's what we have to learn as they go through the phase three trials as we go forward. But in this case, I feel like the president probably wanted to do whatever he could to get better. And he had the option of starting on that medication he took it and maybe that's part of why he seems to be getting better we don't know and i guess we'll find out over the next few days dr joshi I, I appreciate it and as you can tell we're talking about the health component of this we're going to talk about the political part in just a moment dr joshi thanks for your my time. pleasure all right so yeah when we come back the director of jacksonville university's public policy institute joins us you know him well rick mulaney on this situation next on this week in jacksonville This is our moment to build a new American economy for our families and for our communities. When we spend taxpayers' money, we should use it to buy American products and support American jobs. It's time to help small businesses. 
will purchase clean energy technologies to fight climate change and enhance national security. We have to invest in what the jobs and industries of tomorrow are going to be. We have a great opportunity to build back and build back better. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. My father, Bill Harrell, was an exceptional man. He was born down the road in Live Oak, grew up around the world, but loved his summers on the farm. Served in the Army, went to West Point, became a deputy sheriff, and spent 40 years fighting for others. He taught me that there are no shortcuts. His legacy is that our clients deserve nothing less than hard work and dedication. I am proud to continue that philosophy in our work at Harrell & Harrell. Don't settle for less than you deserve. Attention Medicare beneficiaries. If you have or are eligible for Medicaid, please listen closely. You may be eligible for a Medicare Advantage plan from WellCare with a zero or low plan premium. Call now. We can answer your questions and help you enroll over the phone. WellCare provides access to essential benefits that go beyond original Medicare, such as dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage with free home delivery. Plus, extra benefits like free over-the-counter health care items, free transportation, free gym membership, and home-delivered meals. Get more access to care with WellCare's telehealth services, including online doctor visits and a 24-hour nurse advice line. WellCare's contract with Medicare to provide plans that may be perfect for you. Call 1-866-561-0106. That's 1-866-561-0106. I worked for 40 years and paid my taxes. I've earned my Social Security and Medicare. But Joe Biden, he spent his 40 years in Washington trying to cut Social Security and raise our retirement age. Now, Biden has a crazy plan to put illegal immigrants on Medicare. That could bankrupt the program. Joe Biden's time has come and gone. I don't trust him with America's future. Preserve America PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. You know the controversy. A million mail-in ballots delivered to voters too late. I've been digging into this contentious mail-in voting story for months. Now the I-Team is putting the U.S. Postal Service to the test. Revealing exactly how long it could take your vote to be delivered. I'm going to vote in person. Why? My vote counts. I absolutely believe that they can handle this. And whether or not your vote will count if it's delivered like this. Mail-in voting under the microscope. Monday at 6 p.m. on News 4 Jax. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. Thank you so much for staying with us this morning. Yesterday, President Trump posted a four-minute video on Twitter while at Walter Reed. He thanked medical professionals there for his care, and he thanked the American people for their support. The president said he's starting to feel good, and he gave his explanation as to why he was taken to Walter Reed. But I had no choice because I just didn't want to stay in the White House. I was given that alternative. Stay in the White House, lock yourself in, don't ever leave, don't even go to the Oval Office, just stay upstairs and enjoy it. Don't see people, don't talk to people, and just be done with it. And I can't do that. I had to be out front, and this is America, this is the United States, this is the greatest country in the world, this is the most powerful country in the world. I can't be locked up in a room upstairs and totally safe and uh, just say, hey, whatever happens, happens. I can't do that. The White House also releasing these photos of the president at Walter Reed. He's seen in the conference room tables in the presidential suite. And Walter Reed, of course, at the military hospital just outside Washington, D.C. It's in Bethesda and really about nine miles from the White House itself. Rick Mullaney is with us as we continue covering the president's battle with coronavirus. And so, Rick, there's also this battle called campaign for yeah. re-election. Yeah. Uh, this seems to be another shift in course, another big change to what's happening with campaigning in 2020. Well, no question, Ken, and it's going to affect the campaign. Some ways are practical. The president loves that in-person campaigning. That's his strength. He has those rallies. He gets energies off of it. Obviously, with 29 days to Election Day, that is going to be off the table for a bit. We'll have to wait and see how long. The other piece of this in terms of the campaign is what about the debate on October 15th? Does that go forward or not? I also expect you may see increased attention on the vice presidential debate that's coming up. Interesting to keep an eye on, too. As we see how the president is doing over the next few days, how does this affect his message and how does it affect how he campaigns after that? He, of course, will be having to do a lot of this virtually. A lot of it will depend on his energy level. But there is no question 
that this does impact the campaign significantly. He does have surrogates. He's got some very fine surrogates. They're active. They're energetic. But there's no one like the president himself. So I guess one of the first things that leaps to mind, does it mean the, the campaigning is sidelined until the president is completely healthy, healthy enough to do virtual campaigning? How does this change what the president's side does? No, the campaign goes forward, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to lack its, its chief, uh, yeah. the person who's doing the most for it. I mean, he does have great surrogates. Vice President Pence, of course, will have a, a bigger role. The surrogates with his children. He has some in Florida, such as Marco Rubio and Pam Bondi. He has others around the country. But already you saw he had to cancel a fundraiser. He had to cancel a personal appearance. It's going to change the nature of the campaign, may change a little bit of the messaging. The campaign goes on, but not in the same way. So when this first came out on Friday, we heard from analysts, including you, that said, hey, the diagnosis now puts COVID-19 front and center of the campaign. Why is that not great for what the president uh, wants to, you know, he's trying to be reelected here. Why is that not great for him? In the end, Kent, when you look at COVID-19, overall, it has been a political liability for the president. If you go back to January, pre-COVID-19, there's little doubt that the president was on his way to re-election. He was doing very, very well. The game changer in 2020, and there have been a lot of game changers in 2020, yes, but the, the game changer <laughs> has been COVID-19. The president was leading Joe Biden in the spring until late spring. Since then, Joe Biden has had a pretty consistent lead. A lot of that has been COVID-19. The public's perception, when you look at the polling, is that the president has had very mixed results in terms of how he's handled it. When the opening opened up on the Supreme Court and he was able to announce that he was appointing uh, Judge Barrett, that began to change the conversation. And what President Trump wants to do is not make it a referendum on him and COVID-19. He wants to shift to Joe Biden. He wants to define Joe Biden, and he wants to talk about issues such as the Supreme Court, law and order, support for the police, tax policy, a whole r range of issues. But for the next 29 days, 20 COVID-19 will be front yeah. and center. And when you're talking COVID-19, generally speaking, that's an advantage to Joe Biden. Yeah, so I, I want to give you a look at some of the people that we've learned have tested positive in the last few days. One of the president's personal assistants, Nick Luna, tested positive after traveling with the president several times recently. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, we understand he tested positive. He had been helping with debate prep, but uh, later checked himself into the hospital. Former White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway, one of the people at last Saturday's Amy Coney Barrett announcement there, she tested positive. And we know at least three Republican senators have tested positive. Here's the list. Mike Lee, Utah, Tom Tillis, North Carolina, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. There are other people who have been involved in this, uh, caught up in what everybody has been facing this year in coronavirus. Uh, many are now asking what would happen if President Trump were to be incapacitated by the coronavirus. So I want to uh, dive into that a little bit, but here's a little bit about what we know it could happen. If his condition were to become serious, President Trump could sign a letter that allows Vice President Pence to take over. And then when he feels better, the president signs another letter taking back control. And if the president tried to continue working even though he's sick, too sick, so that's 25th Amendment could come in. The cabinet could vote to remove him and install the vice president. We want to be clear, it's possible, but that seems pretty unlikely at this point, right? It does. Let's be clear about exactly what this is. In 1967, we passed the 25th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Subsection three of that amendment provides for what you just described about, which is a fairly routine procedure. It's voluntary in which the president simply sends a letter to the president pro tem or the house and, and the house uh, speaker that he will be or she will be uh, incapacitated for a period. George W. Bush did this when he did, had a colonoscopy in the early 80s. Ronald Reagan did this when he had some surgery. And then at the end of that period, they write a letter that they're going to be back. And during that time, the vice president becomes acting president. So that's very voluntary, very routine. However, if something were to suddenly happen and he was physically incapacitated, you go to subsection four of the 25th Amendment. There, you could have, excuse me, the vice president plus the cabinet, they could invoke by a vote, they could then temporarily become acting, pre acting president. And the president, when he was better, could write a letter undoing that. So it's a fairly routine process. It was designed after the assassination of, of John Kennedy in the, in the 60s. It went into effect in 1967. But it is set forth in the U.S. Constitution, and those would be the procedures if that was to take yeah, place. we, we got to wrap up, but does, is that part of why we saw the president the last couple of days, where he makes an announcement, where he does Twitter video and shows shows everybody, hey, I'm still working. He wants to have the American public confidence in what he's, do, in comf in what he's doing. I don't anticipate you're going to see that letter. But as the doctor said yesterday, the next 48 hours to 72 hours, we have to see how he does. I don't expect to see that letter. Rick, I appreciate it. Thanks for your, your insights. All right, stay with us here. The second lady of the United States journeyed to Northeast Florida Wednesday. The impact that visit is designed to make here in our area. Next on This Week in Jacksonville. Pain can 
can't wait. Mobility can't wait. Blood pressure can't wait. Don't put your health on hold. Make an appointment today with Baptist Health. Call 904-202-4U. President Trump made a promise to protect our Social Security and Medicare. He kept that promise, and he always will. Today, Social Security and Medicare are strong. And under President Trump, they will never be cut. President Trump is protecting pre-existing conditions. Prescription drugs are more affordable. The cost of insulin is going down. Under President Trump, our benefits and our health care are safe and secure. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Want beautiful floors fast? The Floor Traders got that. Want to save money? Well, we've got that too. At the Floor Trader, you'll find the latest styles that are kid-proof, pet-proof, waterproof, and yes, even budget-proof. Plus, everything's in stock and ready to go, so you can take it home the very same day. And right now, it's our Year of the Home flooring sale. Save up to 50% store-wide and no interest financing for 36 months, only at the Floor Trader. Duval County has some of the oldest schools in the state of Florida. Our buildings and safety have been neglected, harming our students. But together, you and I can do something about it. We can ensure that every child in every neighborhood has the chance to attend a safe school where their opportunity to grow is fully supported. As a father to children in our public schools, I'm supporting the half penny, and I hope you do too. At Farrah and Farrah, we specialize in accidents involving commercial trucks. Don't let the insurance company play around with your future. Call us. Multiply your winnings up to 200 times with Times the Cash Scratch Offs. The Florida Lottery. It's your ticket. Claim it. Tamia Thomas supports dangerous ideas for Jacksonville. Defund our police, close Florida prisons, and let violent criminals out on the street. She supports shorter sentences for murderers and rapists, but wants to take away protections for our police. Tamia Thomas is dangerous for Jacksonville. But Wyman Duggan stands with first responders to keep us safe. He supports better schools, fixing our unemployment system, and clean water. Wyman Duggan for a better, safer Jacksonville. Sky 4, one of a kind, the only local helicopter bringing you important stories at night. Knees can't wait. Hearts can't wait. Screenings can't wait. Don't put your health on hold. Make an appointment today with Baptist Health. Call 904-202-4U. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Earlier this week, I sat down with Jacksonville City Councilman Rory Diamond. He's also the leader of Canines for Warriors, an organization that got a visit from Second Lady Karen Pence on Wednesday. She was in Jacksonville launching a new program for military spouses. And again, this visit was before we learned President Trump and others in the White House had tested positive for COVID-19. I started our conversation by asking Councilman Diamond about his, how that visit with Karen Pence came about. Hey, so it was actually a long time in the coming. Uh, she had been trying to come visit with us for quite some time, and it just so happens that she had a visit for Jacksonville scheduled. Of course, it's campaign season, so being in Florida makes some sense. And they made not just some time, but a lot of time to come visit our campus and learn what we're doing. It was spectacular. We've got some video of what was happening there and her kind of a tour. It, what did you share with her while she was with you? Yeah, so the number one thing was to show what our program can do for veterans who are struggling with suicidal thoughts. I mean, we've got about 670 graduates, 70 2% of them are struggling with suicidal thoughts. Most of them have attempted suicide before they come to Canines for Warriors. And we've had one tragic suicide out of all those graduates. So we figured this out and we wanted to share it with her because she's on the front line of helping drive the national conversation in veteran suicide prevention. Well, yeah, certainly a focus on vet veterans with what she was doing. She was also at NAS Jacks. She was there launching a new program for military spouses and uh, speaking to people there on base. Uh, so there's a connection though, isn't there? The lifestyle or quality of life for veterans while they're serving or their families 
and what happens when they separate from service and, and can come up on those suicidal thoughts or life is tough, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you're jumping right on it, exactly. So it's never one thing. It's a combination of things that leads to crisis. So maybe it's a financial problem or a mortgage or complicated romantic relationships. Any numbers of things can slide someone towards chaos and then crisis. So our job at Canines for Warriors is to keep them up here in the safe zone. And what Mrs. Pence was talking about was, you know, how do you make sure that a military spouse has got a job and can support a family, especially if you have a disabled or uh, a spouse or someone who's been in the military who can no longer provide for the family like they used to. Yeah. So uh, the focus of canines, I, we know you're headquartered here, but you right. guys, you're helping people across the country, right? Yeah, we've been so blessed. I mean, the uh, First Coast has like risen up underneath us. And so we've got a campus in Gainesville. We're uh, broke ground in San Antonio where we should have a beautiful facility there in 2021. And we're serving warriors in 48 states now. And uh, we're, we're very proud, but well, we could not have done this without our friends here in Jacksonville being underneath us. 48 states, you haven't gotten to Alaska or Hawaii yet? or North those? Dakota, South Dakota. So so if you know a veteran who has PTSD in one of those two states, we would love to serve them. Uh -huh. Try and. Well, I, I do want to show you some more video. Mrs. Pence also visited Social Grounds Coffee in Jacksonville while she was here. Jason and Mandy Kellaway, uh, their owners, a veteran, a military spouse, an entrepreneur there. Social Grounds' mission is to help transitioning veterans fighting mental health issues. So this, as you mentioned, uh, part of uh, the many things that are factors in, in, in all of these things are trying to help. You mentioned Firewatch, something yeah. that, that you helped get started here in Jacksonville. Yeah, that's right. So we love Jason and Mandy. They're doing a great job. And they're part of this uh, community effort called the Firewatch. This is a five-county consortium, which is headquartered in Jacksonville. We started it last year. And it's the first ever regional effort to lower our veteran suicide rate. And our job is just to put our arms around our veterans and to empower everybody who knows or loves a veteran to see the signs, of if they might be slipping towards crisis, and know how to get them quickly to resources. because. Just like learning CPR, if you're there at the right time with the right skills, you can stop something bad from happening. Yeah, so I just want to point out, I did not serve in the military. I'm part of Firewatch. It's an important effort. Did you serve in the military? I did not, but I'm part of the Firewatch. And, and, and that's that's the point, whether you served or not. But if that concerns you and you want to be part of that effort, uh, certainly there is a space for you. Yeah. Always a space to talk about uh, great things happening when, it talk, when we're trying to support our military community here in Northeast Florida. Right. Lori Diamond. Canines for Warriors, uh, Jacksonville City Council. Thanks for the time. Appreciate you, sir. Thanks for having me. Right. Yeah, good visit there. So I'm Kent Justice, and thanks for watching on air on Channel 4. We're also on the CW17, and we're online at newsforjax.com. Next week, a talented duo from Florida State College, Jacksonville. Professors Daniel Cronrath and J.R. Woodward help us sort out the amendments on the ballot. Uh, that's pretty key to what's happening here in November. This week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. People are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida and South Georgia's number one source for local news.